Welcome to the Minotaur's Maze. My guest today is an ex-lawyer turned entrepreneur and business owner, Ayaz Sabur. Ayaz, thank you for joining me and welcome. No problem. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Well, as I always start with these shows, although it's been a while, just give us a brief introduction and background into yourself and where you've been and where you're at now. Yeah, sure. So uh, firstly, thanks for having me. Um, Honoured to be on your, on your podcast. Um, yeah, so my journey is a bit of an um, odd one, I'd say. Um, so I, you know, ever since being lower, I wanted to be a, a lawyer. Uh, funnily enough, it came from watching Jim Carrey's Liar Liar of all things. I'm not sure that says about me. Um, <laughs> but ever since I watched that, I was like, I want to be a lawyer. And... Um, Continued on that journey through, um, you know, uh, college, university, came out of university, um, uh, studied at Bangor University in North Wales, um, graduated with a first class in law and business. Um, during uni, I actually found out I was dyslexic, and so it made historic bad grades or lesser grades um, <laughs> make sense a little bit, mm. um, and came out of uni not really knowing how to qualify as a solicitor, thinking I'd done it. Um, some career services at universities are better than others. Uh, some prep you for the world of work, others uh, don't. Uh, so I came out thinking I was almost qualified and, and came for a really big shock when I realised I've got quite a bit to do. <laughs> uh, so the first hurdle for me was kind of finding a legal job. Um, it, it seemed the most natural next step post-graduation to work in the legal profession um, and face the barrier that I think a lot of people still face, even though it was almost a decade ago, not that I'll actually met when I graduated, um, that uh, most places want six months experience for an entry-level paralegal position. And I was, uh, face I was in a hamster wheel trying to find this, uh, you know, unicorn paralegal position that eventually came uh, and eventually I had to move my life right the way down to Cardiff. I'm originally from near Manchester um, so I had to move my life all the way down to Cardiff for a paralegal position um, and you know it, it got my foot into the door into, into the world of work. Um, I did my LPC part time um, and subsequently you know went on to make applications, had a couple of years which I'm sure we'll go into um, of, of really you know, getting nowhere and frustrated with the process and, and rejections. Um, to then being successful on the journey, uh, getting a training contract offer from a top expensive law firm, training with them in 2019 to 2021. Um, obviously, COVID happened, which changed a lot of people's lives as well. Um, and um, yeah, qualified in 21 into regulatory compliance and investigations. Um, works for a wonderful team. Uh, but also had a few passion projects of my own that I wanted to actually go and try and, and, you know, commit to at a point in my life where I didn't necessarily have any commitments to, you know, necessarily prevent me from doing or, or at least trying to, to do that. And yeah, so I built, um, two businesses. Uh, one is, um, a mentoring service for aspiring lawyers where I help aspiring lawyers navigate the very, very difficult process of um training contract applications and then going towards and, and getting qualified as a solicitor um and secondly my partner and i have um a property business where we specialize in short-term lets um in and around greater manchester um so yeah that's a short three minute Brilliant. interest so i am thank you. <laughs> well thank you for that um so obviously there's probably quite a bit to unpack in there um and you know in line with this theme of the podcast obviously you know the minotaur's maze and minotaur's being symbolic of fears um challenges insecurities doubts i mean there could be obviously internal challenges um which we all have and then external so the question then really is what has been would you say your biggest internal minotaur in terms of your mindset and fears and doubts um and your external minotaur maybe it's the same thing or maybe it's a different thing so I know you mentioned stuff about dyslexia there. Or maybe it was mm. that, or maybe it was something else. Uh, maybe you can just elaborate, and then uh, we'll go into a bit more detail. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think, you know, being completely candid, I think for me, and, and I think it's still true, 
um, as much as I've tried to work on it. I think I'm my biggest mentor, mentor, um, it, in a sense that, you know, and I think everyone struggles with it to a certain degree in, in feeling whether or not they feel good enough to do something. Um, and you know, for some people, I think it's more critical than others. And I think for me, I've, you know, been able to, um, manage it in a way that doesn't cripple me anymore, but certainly when I was a fresh graduate looking at the legal profession and looking at getting into the world of work and looking at becoming a success, um, and everyone's definition of success is different, which is why it's in quotation marks. Um, I definitely think my own inability to recognize my own worth or inability to recognize my own, um, ability really um was my biggest can sometimes still be my biggest um fear of internal and external because it presents itself in very very different ways um and i think yeah that 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 certainly was a big journey to kind of realize and something that i see on a regular basis with uh, aspiring lawyers that i speak to um that you know, the legal profession in its, in its very nature is, is highly competitive and highly, sh you know, stressful as well and highly demanding that initially, you know, it's almost as if you're, you're thrust in with scare tactics of, you know, this is the number of hours, this is how it is, this number of people apply it and all of a sudden all these numbers and all of these, um, you know, all stacked against you make you start thinking, well, is it why would it be me why me if, if of all these people you know and it, it's about getting to that stage where you don't let that cripple you and hold you back from what your um intended goal uh mission is so yeah i think that's mine yeah no brilliant and um you know just for the wider audience that don't really understand the the legal oh. industry so you know most people think once you've got got a law degree you know you're a lawyer or whatnot and they start sending new cases from <laughs> speeding tickets to advice on every little thing um, yeah, yeah. the reality is obviously you leave university it's typically a three-year degree and it means nothing. <laughs> it literally does mean. I mean, obviously, you learn skills and whatnot, but you do not qualify as a lawyer. You can't even get a job with with that, to be honest, unless you really go out of your way. But um, the traditional path would be three year degree, and then you either become a um, a solicitor or a barrister. In which case, you either do the LPC, which is the legal practice course, or the BBC, the the, the bar course. And then after that, you're still not qualified because then you need to get a two year training contract with a law firm so a lot of people go to university to get the degree but then it stops there let's go to law school but even after law school even fewer get an actual training contract now i think it's changed now there's different roads in um but having said that being the quickest road in doesn't necessarily mean that's the typical road because some people might not get a training contract for for years to come like uh i mean I'd be interested to know why you wanted to, obviously you mentioned uh, the movie, but was there something more into why you wanted to be a lawyer? Um, and I, I say that because for me, when I chose to become a lawyer, it wasn't because of I wanted to be a lawyer. It was I needed to become a professional into something. I hated science. And then law was like the only kind of profession that didn't really involve science which seemed respectable so i never enjoyed it um i did well at school i would have done well at school um regardless of the topic so when i did get involved in in the actual practice of life i hated it day one hated it year right. after year hated it <laughs> and it, it took me a long time to kind of get out but what was kind of like your motivating factor to get into law and, and how was your journey into finding that training contract was it really difficult i, I imagine it was um and what were some of the challenges that you faced individually yeah, sure. Um, yeah, no. Obviously, liar, liar. Uh, the 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 rationale from the film ended at some point, and and reality, you know, set in. And I went on my own kind of journey, discovery, um, to to understand the profession. I think, you know, it, <clears throat> to be honest, I think it was always just, you know, similar to yourself in that. It was a profession, it was a, a respectable profession 
Um, and I think for a certain period, you probably do up until, you know, the likes of even post-graduation, in all honesty, I don't think I've done an awful lot of searching into what the actual world of law looked like. Um, I think, and I, I, I've, I've openly said this a couple of times, but I was quite naive in this process, and I didn't actually realise that law firms occupy some of the biggest and best real estate in, you know, the major cities, for example. My understanding of law firms was actually, you know, walking down the high street and seeing your local solicitor's firms on the street. That was actually my perception. And that was why I'd had work experience. Um, it was only post-graduation uh, that I actually had to, you know, to go and fulfill the ambition of getting a career, go on that journey to understand what it is um, I wanted from a career. And, you know, I'd always, I think, been quite business-minded. Um, you know, my family, my dad um, had a corner shop, a petrol station ever since I was little. Uh, so I've always been, you know, and all my uncles and aunties all have their own individual businesses. And, um, you yeah, know, so it's always intrigued me to uh, to be in and around business. So the natural step along with my law with business career was to look at the law of businesses, essentially. Um, and it was that journey of discovery that led me to the, you know, firms that I applied to that were probably in the top 10 to top 50 law firms in, in, in the country. Um, you know, and more I learned about the profession at that point from, and, and working as a paralegal too, um, you know, from my own perspective, I quite enjoyed it. Um, enjoyed the, you know, the, the fact that it was a desk job. I enjoy being in a suit every day, personally. Uh, not so much anymore. I think COVID changed a lot of people's <laughs> perceptions on all of this. Um, but at that point, coming out of university, I did feel like um, the big deal. Um, and quite enjoyed that, you know, that side of things and, and the work that I was given as a paralegal was interesting, um, it, you know, because of the team I was working in as a paralegal was a new team. I was working directly with one of the uh, paralegal and direct at the end of the partner. Um, you know, and that kind of experience, level of exposure at such junior level is unheard of. So I think I had a really good experience in, in that regard. Um, and yeah, so the journey of kind of frame contract, yeah, that, that wasn't, that wasn't fun at all. Uh, it's, it's, it's the biggest driving, driving factor, the, the journey I went on as to why I do what I can now, because I'm, I know 100% what, excuse me, what that pain feels like and how soul destroying and how depressing and how alone and how lost you can feel on that journey. Um, you know, so first year of applications, didn't have an approach, didn't really know me, didn't know my worth, didn't know who I wanted to work for, location, I think I was predominantly blind to London firms, um, went for anyone that had decided a decent salary, um, you know, all the usual um, shiny pennies that they throw at you and you think, that that sounds good, and, and I went with it on that basis and really nothing more, and didn't get anywhere. Um, I actually got through to the second stage uh, for the firm I, I trained at, DWF, in my first cycle, so that kind of is nice. Um, but that was it. That was the only, that was the only kind of, Piece of luck I got at that point, studying the LPC part time whilst working full time, so that was brutal. Um, didn't have any time. Uh, so it was just rejection after rejection, um, not necessarily knowing myself and what I wanted to do. And also, and truthfully, opening every application as I started this, uh, this topic off with thinking, why would this firm hire me? You know, the first thing you look at really when you're applying to these kind of firms is the statistics of how many people actually apply to this firm. And as soon as you see 1,500, 2,000 people, if not more, you know, you can lead yourself down the rabbit hole of going, well, why would they choose me? Um, and that was completely the wrong approach. It does with anything. Um, if you go into it thinking, I can't do this, 
I'm pretty certain you will come out not being able to do it. Yep. If you go into it thinking, I can't do this, or I will give it my best attempt and I'll give it my best go, you will see better results and it's, it's, it's applicable for anything. So I had to really work myself on changing that approach. And I think working as a paralegal helped, you know, getting that experience, getting that exposure getting that knowledge and, and kind of seeing that I can do the work. Um, and that why me changed from, you know, why would they hire me to why not me? Um, and that was a huge shift because then I would walk into the room three centimeters taller, chest mm -hmm. out a little bit, thinking actually, you know, I can put up a good show in, in this open day assessment center, whatever it might be, this interview, I can do it, you know, I can give myself justice. And that change in, in mindset is, is super powerful. So I have to work on that. I can't really pinpoint because I, I imagine it will be a question, uh, but I can't pinpoint how that change happened. I think it was a process of developing as a person, developing as a professional and, you know, slowly recognizing that I'm able and um, capable of doing the same as, you know, the others around me. And that's all you want to be able to do. You don't need to be better than people. It's not competition. It seems as though it's competition, mm. but you just need to be as good as people. And then the rest is down to you, how you perform at interviews, how you showcase your abilities, how you showcase your skills. And that's why the, the real kind of fight so to speak happens but the fight doesn't happen in you becoming better than people it's not about being better it's about being good at what you do and then being able to showcase that to the to the people that you you want to see essentially and that's why i got good at hmm. in, that's an interesting point um because i know many many people that would say that's not always the case because you could be the most skilled in the room. You could be the hardest worker. You could be getting the most results. But especially if you're in a big city law firm where there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people there, I mean, it might not be down to your skill set and what you've done. It might be just a favorite person just gets picked or somebody else gets picked. Um, and a lot of people, I remember back in the days, in those days, a lot of people did complain about this. They, they went above and beyond, did more hours than other people. They did a lot of work. And it seemed like the hard, harder they work, the more responsibilities they got, but then they never got the promotions or the training contracts. And I mean, I could tell you quite a fair few stories, which we won't really get into, but it hasn't it, always been uh, saying, clean. Yeah. Let's say it's not always been clean in, in, in law firms. And, and mm. you know, there are some stereotypes and some, you know, stories that you get, which they're not altogether entirely untrue. So stuff like that does happen um you know maybe some relationships with partners that shouldn't be there and that kind of thing so um how would you say from a realistic practical perspective is it enough to be the hardest worker in the room to be the most uh disciplined to to be the most result oriented or do you need to go a different road maybe what would the different road be so the different road for me, for example, was um, like when, when I was in a big city law firm, I didn't even bother. Like, to be honest, I only applied for one training contract when I was at law school mm. um, and, and you know, I was never really interested. But um, the reason why I never applied when I was at a big city law firm was because of the process. Like, you know, one, as you mentioned, the numbers, you know, you're yeah. competing with hundreds, maybe thousands of people. But then there's like a two year waiting list. So even the, the application process might be a yeah, year yeah. long and God knows how many steps and processes are in between. And if you're successful, then it starts in two years. Yeah. And then when it starts, then you've got another two years yeah. before it finishes. So you look at another five years, I'm like, what is the point of that? Yeah. Um, so like, I mean, I then left, but to, to me, as I tried to get out of the industry. So when I left that city law firm, I tried to find a job in a completely different sector and I just couldn't find it. Um, okay. And it was just a last resort. Another kind of job came up in a, a local law firm, a small law firm. And I went to that law firm and I didn't apply for a training contract. I just worked there for one year. But because there wasn't hardly any competition, 
it was easy to get the training contract. And again, I didn't apply for it. They just gave it to me after a year because they saw my work rate and then I got it. So I suppose when I said you, the road is instead of trying to apply to one of these bigger law firms, maybe go to a smaller one, work where there's less competition and mm. then get the training contract because you don't have that bigger competition and you are more likely to get something based on your results and performance. But then my question to you would be, at that point in your life, when you went to that smaller law firm, what was the, what was the goal for Zilfa Kuru in five years? Where, where, there was what, none. What you I'll be straight up. There was none. Uh, so right. I, I absolutely hate these questions and interviews when, you, when, you, when they give you these questions, like, why, where do you see yourself in five years? I'm like, I don't even know where I see myself in five days. Never mind five, sure. five years. Sure. But at I that think, time, yeah. yeah, at that time, to be honest, it was, um, I hated law. Uh, I wanted to get away from it. I tried to find a job in another sector. I couldn't. And then I got this job and it's just one of those things where, you know what, I'm I'm comfortable now. I'm working. I'm happy mm. where I am. The, the team was decent. I, I didn't like the work, but uh, I made some good friends with the colleagues. Um, this was a job in Bradford. So the lunches were amazing. Um, I'd, 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 you know, you just get comfortable. And then obviously they, they offered the train. I mean, basically my senior put it to their partner can we give him a training contract now? And it was just a yes. It was literally, that's it. That's how I got the training contract. Nice. Um, and, and even then, like, it was just, okay, let's qualify and see how it goes. But there was no plan after that. It was just, you know, as you do, once you get comfortable, you just go through the day-to-day grind. And I suppose that's probably why I hated it so much because there was no ambition. There was no, I mean, that's a separate topic, but I'm sure we'll move into that. But back to the original question, is it worth a student today to go through that big process in a bigger law firm or would it be better to go to a smaller law firm where you've got more chances of getting a contract? So it, I, think it's, I think it's layered. It, it, the response is layered in a sense that, for me, if, if someone would have come to me um, back when I was applying for training contracts and said, I was, don't, don't worry about these firms that you're looking at. Go to you know, your local firm and they'll give you a training contract on the school. Um, because I have the ambition of wanting to work in a city in that. And mm. it's not just for work, it's also the whole, um, the whole uh, aspect of it from, you know, living in the city to, you know, the offices being the most modern places, you know, no expense spared almost kind of environment that was my ambition Mm -hmm. um and i think if if someone would have said that to me i would have and and let's say i'd have taken i would have always had that itch to scratch and i would never have personally i don't think felt satisfied or fulfilled in what i was doing and then i think it's a, a very unknown path to then try and get yourself to where you want to be um at that kind of point so um you know when i have these conversations with my individual mentees for example i will always start with well what's the goal if it's loose then you've got that freedom to then be able to go and try different things but if it's firm and 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 i think increasingly now i don't know if you agree from your interaction but increasingly more and more especially because my kind of client base comes off LinkedIn, which could also automatically mean that they're already engaged in the process. Um, I feel like a lot of people actually really know what they want. Um, So then you can't talk them out and say, well, go this way. And also to kind of, to, to go full circle with the question, I think it is enough to be hardworking, results orientated, um, driven, motivated. I think where people actually lack in their, um, you know, what, what is their biggest weakness, so to speak, is how they articulate that to the employer. Mm-hmm. And that's in a whole myriad of ways. You might, they might nail the applications every single time. And, you know, the application form itself is upwards of 900, 1,000 words, sometimes even made it more. Um, but then they might get to video interview or interview or some other stage and then they'll get the best of them, naturally, mm-hmm. because you're so, you're so um, 
you realize the impact of what this could mean. This is life changing. My life then becomes secure. I've been through this. I, I, I know what that felt like. I thought as soon as I get my training contract, my life is set. I am set for life. This is, you know, I'll never have to look back. I'll never have to worry again. Became an entrepreneur, so that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, but, uh, um, you know, so I understand. And, and, and so it's about doing the, the, I genuinely believe with the right idea as to where you want to be. Firstly, I think that's so important. That vision is important because what I always say to my mentees, the, the, the reason I do what I do, and I will quiz you consistently to understand what you want, because what I don't want to happen is for you to then, three, four years down the line, be waking up every day with Sunday bread. You know, going through the same circle, thinking, why the F did I do this? That's not what I want to happen. If you're unsure, I will quiz you, quiz you, quiz you, and I will help people. I do help people understand what it is they want from their career, because that's firstly really important. And then it's about doing the basics right, right? It, it, you'd be surprised how many people don't do the basics right. They apply for 40, 50 firms because they think it's a numbers game. Yes, it's a numbers game. But it's also about doing quality work, right? Law is a quality profession. Everything is super precise. So it's about quality of quantity. Yes, it is a numbers game, but it's about finding that balance. And then it's about doing everything else on the process. It's not perfect. No one's perfect. No one's that finished art school. It's a training contract that's called training. It's a mm. contract where you get trained. So they're not expecting the finished art school. So don't try and be, don't pretend to be the finished art school. It's about doing stuff along the way that just really highlights to the firm, to the people that you're speaking to, to the people that you're interacting with. This person is motivated. They like us specifically, whoever that firm is, and they can do the job. That's it. It's not simple. It's, it's simplifying a very, very complex process. Mm -hmm. But I think it is simpler than how people build it up to be personally. No, brilliant, brilliant. I love that answer. And just something I you know, want to pick up on there. So um, I know you mentioned that a lot of people in your experience know exactly what they want. In my experience, I would say they know what they want until they get to a certain level. And by that, I mean the majority of the people that went through that process is they need to go to obviously university, they need to get the, uh, the legal practice course, they need to get a training contract. But then they don't think anything beyond that. It's always, I need that training contract. I need to qualify. I need to qualify. They have this in their mind. I need to qualify. Okay, how? I just need to qualify. But then you ask them, you know, for example, I used to have a lot of these conversations that, you know, I speak to people and they're like, oh, I just want a training contract. Or why? So I can qualify. Okay, why? And they've got no answer. Yeah. They don't yeah, know yeah. what they don't want to do next. I've got, I've got all men who uh, spent years applying to, um, I think, two or three years applying to American firms in London. And for those that don't know, uh, the hours at American firms are not to be snuffed at at all. Um, they want your pound of flesh. Um, you get paid well, but they want their pound of flesh. Um, mm. And he's from Manchester. He's a family guy. Um, yeah, I'm pretty certain he cares for his dad, um, cares for the household. Um, and I, I sat him down and I really spoke to him, yeah, you know, training contracts, status, all of this stuff is good. But think about the realities of what the decisions you're making at this current point will look like in three, four years' time. This is the whole process of, you know, understanding what it is you want. And some people know specifically, you know, I can't do it for two years and then I'll look to move out. That's perfectly fine. If that's the attitude you want, by all means, go do it. But if you're just doing it for the sole purpose of following the crowd or the money yes. or the status, then let's have an actual chat, figure out what it is specifically that you want your career to look like, your day-to-day. -to -day. You don't want to be working all hours at God's end. You want to be finishing work, being able to spare time with your loved ones, being able to see the you know, kids in the evening, buttons spare, whatever it might be. Then in that case, these are the firms you need to look for. In the place you're already living, do you, do you see what I mean? So it's it's the process of not just understanding. You know, it's beyond. I think one of my particular skills, personally, 
is being able to understand people better than they might understand themselves mm. once they get yeah. to know them. Because, you know, it, I fell into the trap where I just wanted the status, the mm -hmm. London, the, you know, yeah. whatever came with all of that, which was not, which was probably a long commute and a miserable <laughs> Monday to Friday. I'm not sure. I never went, but, um, <laughs> but I think, you know, once you understand that actually you need to think about it in depth and think about it from a more practical perspective, not just because I think what people also miss and, um, um, misunderstand, and, uh, and I don't think the legal world is very good at reflecting this. I think they're getting slightly better, but not great. Um, is that the regions and the other cities also do excellent legal work. People automatically or yeah, automatically assume that the only place to do great multi-million pound m &A deals, for example, is only in the city of London. That's apparently the only place, right? That's everybody's perception and that's why everybody leads there. And that's why everybody seemingly, and, and I always say this to my mentees, I genuinely believe that those people that don't think like that from a practical perspective are the reason why, you know, they are the ones that become depressed, stressed, and, and not, um, not, um, in a local profession, for example. And I hope, I don't know, but I hope the conversations that I have with my mentees at this stage and at this juncture in their career is in depth enough for them to lead on to a very happy, fulfilling and, and, and rewarding career because they've thought about the right things at the right time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, brilliant. And obviously, you've gone through that process. You've had the ambition. You've had the desire. You've got the training contract. You've qualified. And then you stopped being a lawyer. <laughs> Talk to me about that. What, what changed? What happened? Why did you stop? Why did you leave? Uh, what, what was the process? What was the thinking? What was the you challenges? And, and you what had happened? to ask. Uh, no. um, <laughs> you, know, it, <laughs> you know, it was, um, it, it was, it was COVID firstly, I think, for, for, a lot of people, it, it broke the cycle, it broke the routine of life. Um, and I personally got a lot of time back in my day, um, when allowed out, no food to work. Um, but it, you know, you were on house arrest for the majority when we were in lockdown. Um, and funny enough, the way DWF's annual leave worked that year, they changed it like midway through the year, so you had to use all of your, this is a long one, this story, but we will get that. Um, uh, they changed it. So you had to use all your annual leave by the end of April. And I had 11 days to use in a lockdown. And I said to the partner I was working for, I was like, I don't really want to take two weeks off in lockdown. And he was like, I don't really want to either. I was like, okay, can I work just mornings for a month? And he was like, yeah, uh, mornings and no Fridays. So for a whole month, I just worked mornings and no Fridays. I was like, that's fantastic. But in that time, I started learning about different things. Um, uh, so property was something that I was always interested in, which I started learning about, you know, looking into. And also on LinkedIn, I also saw that um, a lot of aspiring lawyers, not limited to them, but what I saw on my feet, were worried about what the future looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we in your profession were also worried about how things look, whether there were going to be layoffs, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, remembering, what that felt like when I was going through the process and the world was normal. I tried to think what that feels like when the world was mm. in, a, in an unknown state, for example. So I started uh, an informal WhatsApp group um, where I just put out to uh, everyone on LinkedIn and within the space of like three, four hours, about 150 people joined, oh. um, which, which was like, oh, I'll shut it there or I'll be able to keep <laughs> up with the conversation. Um, and then I started, um, informally mentoring people, um, just kind of, I, I ran sessions every week, um, that were group sessions, uh, I'd either go get a, a friend or colleague or contacts of mine to come speak about their journey, um, or I'd just go Q and A and then f if I had time, I'd do one-to-ones and help people with the process. And through that process, I actually learned that I really enjoy doing this and helping people on that journey. Um, I'd always wanted to do something in this space because that journey of and those feelings I felt, they never left me. You, I, I do find that some people go through that 
and then forget and don't necessarily click back. They're like, yeah, this is, you know, I'm high doing it. But I, I always, and still do, obviously, I, I, I do live and breathe it with my aunties. Um, I, I always wanted to do something in this space. So, um, yeah, that kind of, uh, it spiraled into me thinking of doing this on a more full-time basis. Um, we also started in the, in the property world and then started getting, um, you know, our service plans and it, it was the thought of, and, and you know, it was, it took me a while to actually come to terms with the fact that I was making this decision. Um, but also for me personally, in my personal circumstances, renting a house, don't have a mortgage, don't have dependents, don't have children. It was probably the only time in my life mm. where I think I sh could and should take such a risk. I, I mean, I could see, I said it was at the, the two other factors. Uh, it, one, I looked at the senior lawyers in, you know what I'm going to say, but I looked at the senior lawyers in my profession and actually saw how miserable they were. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not sure this is for me. Um, and um, the second fact thought was that after, I, I forgot what the second point was. Um, but yeah, you know, all of that kind of led me to think I can do it. Um, uh, oh, the time. Sorry, it was the time. You know, as a lawyer, um, you don't get the time to do anything but your job really um and in the time that you do have you want to either spend it with your uh nearest and dearest or you might even be out networking at events and such and you know if i wanted to even try and build something whilst having a job i didn't think it was the most feasible thing to do um so you know i, I had discussions with my, my partner and my father um, friends, family, uh, got their opinion. Sometimes I was crazy. Um, especially cause I worked, you know, I worked so hard to get qualified and it was literally within two months of qualification. That I rang <laughs> What's your first yeah. That? I rang the partner and, and she was like, what's up? And I went, I think I'm going to have my notices in. She said, everything hell I was, I didn't expect that. I was like, yeah, <laughs> sure. Why? Oh, and I told her, and you know what? credit to and that you know and, and i did but genuinely i say this to the day to this day i spent three days at dwf with the biggest smile on my face full of great people um great work um and you know to their credit uh and to the partner's credit and to the team's credit that i was part of they supported me wholeheartedly in, in making the decision to, which which made me feel more comfortable but i felt as though it was a two-way door not a one-way door that if things didn't work out, I did feel as though I had a place to go back to, mm -hmm. um, you know, better circumstance would have allowed if that were to come to fruition. Um, so, you know, I think that made it easier as well, having that conversation and just, you know, I just had to pull it. Otherwise, I don't think I will wash, really. No, no, so much of that resonates. I mean, uh, I completely agree with you. It was the right time to take that risk just to give you context like i took the risk of, of kind of leaving law and doing my own thing at the same time i just became a father and it, i would say this to this day it was the biggest mistake that i made because when you've been a an employee all your life essentially um and even being a good student you've always been told what to do you've been told how to do it and you just do it uh, and you don't really have that many other responsibilities apart from those that are given to you and it's very difficult you don't really truly grasp all that's involved in becoming a, a business owner an entrepreneur like i didn't even start my own law firm at one point you know running a business is hard running a law firm is even harder because of all the compliance and regulation so you know being a first time kind of business owner founder is difficult as it is being a first time father is difficult as it is doing both together at the same time was something that I would not recommend anybody to do uh, ever, ever. Um, but so I absolutely agree with you on, on, on that aspect. Um, and I suppose, would you then go back into law? And did you ever have this more on the status side, this ego thing? Like I had this, which was 
when I did something different, it's just like, this doesn't feel important enough. It doesn't feel like I'm a lawyer. It doesn't have that status. And even though I could be successful at something, that limiting belief is probably what stopped me from being successful at it because of that kind of attachment to the status and the ego. Like, I don't have that lawyer status anymore. Did you ever have anything like that? Or was it kind of easier for you to... The Lego, don't think I was a lawyer long enough to sit with the status. <laughs> um, no. Um, I, so, interesting question. I think, well, uh, firstly, when I go back to law, I can't see it. Mm. Um, but I will never say never. Um, just because. You just don't know. Yeah. You just don't know. Um, I, I don't think I had an affiliation or attachment to the. The state. I agree that I do sometimes sit there and think what I'm doing is not important. Uh, uh, not not important, but not necessarily comparable to a corporate job. Yes. Um, a corporate job, I think, because you have to put a suit on, you go see clients, you go meet people, um, it, it already gives you that sense of importance through... Just it's a, it's a societal conditioning. That's how I yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. I mean, this is status. This is important. Uh, and, and you know, it's not just a societal conditioning thing. It's it legitimately like I have people uh, change the way they interact. When you know, obviously, when you tell me you're a lawyer, you are, typically there's one of two reactions. One is oh wow, and almost like an intimidation kind of thing. Uh, and the second reaction is there's nothing special about you. Well, you're a lawyer. You know? uh, so, yeah. um, but. You know, when you talk to people that, you know, you're a lawyer and stuff, you saw the reaction. And then, but then when you talk about the other businesses, which are non-law related, you know, even when I did like social media management and stuff, it's like, they barely noticed, they barely care. So it, there is societal conditioning and people do react differently to it. And I suppose that was part of why it was so difficult to kind of leave. Um, you, don't, you don't necessarily lose your... And I, I don't, I wouldn't say I lose that status because I think I, I think and the difficulty is you know before we joined today you messaged me saying what would you like to be introduced us um I think I always go with ex-lawyer um and so I think automatically regardless of what's after it whether it's ex-lawyer say owner business owner um whatever it might be ex-lawyer retired um I think automatically that you, you may say mass status, but also you get that level of trust from Absolutely. the recipients of the conversation. Um, so I think, I think it's, a, it's a probably, so consciously without realizing, I probably attach myself to that, that, um, that tag so that I don't necessarily lose it. I don't think I would have been happy to be introduced on this podcast without being called out for you. Yeah. As an example, as an yeah, example, like, I think, yes. yeah. So I think, to a certain extent, yeah, maybe, maybe that, that's um, that's there in me as well. Ah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, so obviously, you've got the property business, you've got the commercial pathway. Um, what next for you then? Is it both of these, or do you have other plans in mind? Like, wh where do you see these businesses going? Where do you see yourself going with with these businesses? Okay. Um, so I think with both, you know, coming out, I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head. Coming out of the world of work where someone tells you what to do here, what to do there. Uh, someone's probably done it before, so there's a precedent somewhere as well that you can kind of manipulate and use as a template. You don't have this here. Um, when you're out on your own, so you have to uh, kind of make it, as you go along, so to speak. Um, and I, it's two years and two months since um, I left. And I think ju it's just now, I think, personally, that I'm actually realising I'm pretty good at what I do. Um, especially the mentoring. I think I'm excellent at what I do. And the property business, credit to my, to my partner and my girlfriend, you know, she's made that into an, uh, a stellar business as well. Um, so I think it's just now where I think I'm about to hit, you know, um, maybe third or fourth gear. Um, mm. I want to, you know, 
I think I mentioned to you a couple of things I want to do in the not too distant future. One, I think I'd like to start a podcast. Um, I think a podcast with people in the legal profession talking about their journey into law, if they're allowed to, uh, um, on, you know, opening honestly about how that journey felt and how they got to where they are. Um, one to highlight the people, um, that because I think what a lot of people don't realize when they're in this journey themselves, they don't realize that the feelings and thoughts that they're having, everyone else from the biggest and best partner that you see or that you think you see will have had those feelings at the point at which you're at. Um, I think more of a more visibility on that will help people realize that they're not alone on this journey and they, you know, then they're not not good enough they're not not capable because they're having these thoughts they are human they are going through a journey that is tough and difficult and what they are experiencing is completely normal and yes you can um embrace it momentarily but it's about how you bounce back from that feeling and carry forward to towards your goal um so it's so a that's one thing I'd like to do. Um, secondly, I'd like to get um, more on TikTok, again, for the aspiring lawyer community. That's where all the Gen Zs are these days, you know, all the Utes. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'd like to do that. Um, I think I'd be quite fun and build it on there anyway. Um, and, yeah, but I think the the main point is exactly what you said. As a business owner, you have to be self-starter. And sometimes when you've got, you know, your own client, I've got my mentees to serve and we've got stuff going on properties, but additional stuff sometimes is hard to, to kick off. But I admit I'm, I'm speaking it on a podcast so that I need to do it. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Absolutely. So once that goes out, we'll, uh, we'll hold you to it. Uh, yeah, but but just on, on, you know, on that point, do you notice a difference between the aspiring loads of today? compared to what the traditional expectation was to be a lawyer? For example, the, the long work hours, the, the years of dedication, or are they more entrepreneurial-minded because they've been exposed to the likes of TikTok and social media at a much early age than certainly I was? Like, mm. I'd say today there's a lot more choices. There's a lot more different roads and different ro- routes. Like, you don't have to go through that traditional path, and it's not shunned upon like back in our day if you did something like well, what i did it was met with this corner why are you doing that why are you wasting your life away yeah yeah. But yeah these guys have grown up where it's almost like being a youtuber has more status than being a lawyer for certain people um, absolutely so is, do they still have that aspiration or, or do they like feel like you know i'm not willing to put in that much effort that much work because i'd rather focus on content creation what's been your experience with the PLVC? you know what i don't think i've had enough experience to make a judgment however what i will say um and i probably say this from experience with some entities gen z don't take sh1 t they don't take crap they are pretty ruthless in terms of what they want they know what they want and they are pretty and set that this is how it needs to look and you know some of them are getting into into the profession and not seeing what that looks like but i've read commentators on the topic uh, especially in law and some funny tiktokers as well um they don't take crap so i, I i'm curious to know if the the profession changes with them mm-hmm. does the profession adapt with i can't I think at this point, from our side, I think we can't see it. But then, pre-COVID, could we have seen such a remote world in the legal world? Um, I don't think we could. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, I think there, there will be a change. Um, you have, I think there'll, there'll be a meeting of two where the kind of, is it baby boomers, I think? They, they will go. Uh, those pilots will go. You'll get millennial managers. They're extremely fair, um, extremely literal in their approach and, 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 and pragmatic in the way they manage. And you'll have Gen Z um, uh, juniors. And I think that will potentially change the profession 
for good in a good way. Um, so I think really it's, I think the jury's out to, to coin a legal reference. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, but yeah, I think if overall there's so, there's so many, like I said, there's so many choices that I think people, I don't think people close doors as much anymore. People mm. keep doors ajar. So they have options and they have, um, places to turn should they need or should they want to. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, the legal industry is going to have to adapt. It's not a question of whether they will. I think they're going to have to. I don't um, think it's a question. Especially because yeah, what you mentioned, you know, the the managers are now going to be millennials and Gen Zs. They're just living in a completely different world from, from what we grew up in. And uh, um, the skills that they are growing up with are skills that businesses need and law firms need. So, you know, I think, you know, I, I hear a lot of law firms talk about being innovative and forward thinking, but then they don't have a YouTube channel. They don't have a podcast. They don't have TikTok. They've they got nothing. So like, how are you innovative? And you know, what, what are you doing? It's, it's still functioning on from things that were new and innovative 20 years ago. So um, it's, it's, absolutely, it's, I think it's going to have to change. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm conscious of the time now. So uh, any any last words before I finish up with the final question and give you the chance to promote yourself? <laughs> Any last words? Uh, I would say just for anyone, you are enough. Believe in yourself. Dream big. Like, just go for it. Absolutely just go for it. Because if you dream big, falling short won't be so bad. Excellent. And and just to link that with kind of like your personal minotaur where you didn't think you, you were enough. So I suppose that comes down to a self-esteem issue. So a young law graduate or law student or somebody in the legal or even a non-legal professional they are going through some self-esteem issues right now they don't think they're worthy they don't think enough what practical steps can they actually take to get out of this rut and start believing in themselves it's a difficult one i i i and to try and get my mentees going through that to do a couple of things um one is just sit down and think about everything that you've done um you know, post age 16, if they're a fresh graduate, for example, um, think about every part time job, every result grade, um, every um, project, work experience that you've done, list it all out. List out what skills you've got from each of those experiences. List out examples of where you've done a particular, you know, where you've shown teamwork, where you've shown communication, for example. Um, and Sit and enjoy basking what you've done. Realize that you've done a hell of a lot, right? Um, don't forget, as a law graduate, for example, law student, we've spent our lives going through academia being told we're, we're okay, we're good. We're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. You're doing fine, well done, here we go. And then as soon as you get the training contract or paralegal application, you get told you're bad, you're not good enough here, there, you know, and it's a big reality check, uh, for most. Um, so everyone is going to have that crisis of self-confidence and, and crisis of self-esteem. So doing small things like that to help you see you for who you are is good. Um, and then secondly, um, and probably the hardest step to take, um, is just get yourself off any social media, LinkedIn particularly, no one goes on LinkedIn to show the bad stuff. Not many go on there to say, you know what, today I got rejected by a firm because I applied for 40 and I didn't put the effort in. The only thing you see on LinkedIn is I've got my pre-vision scheme here, I've just landed my training contract, I've got my dream job, etc., etc. That is going to affect how you feel. It's going to compound the feelings of what you're going through to so get off LinkedIn, get off any WhatsApp group chats that you're part of where that's happening. Whatever the trigger point is for you, get away from it. You have to. You have to put yourself in a space where you can just focus on what's most important. And what is most important, Zofika? You. You are the most important. No one else. No one else is. is Love it. 
Love it. So how can people find out more uh, about you and what you're doing? How can they connect with you? Where's the best place to visit to, to get in touch? Uh, yeah. LinkedIn is probably the best place. Um, I'm always active on LinkedIn. So I spoke A-Y-A-Z-S-A-B-O-R. Um, yeah, be happy to chat to anybody, um, especially anyone at all that's, that's feeling that they are going through a of confidence, um, you know, that are overly so critical, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because I, I, I guarantee that I can help people realize that they are capable and that they are good enough. Um, it's a journey. It's, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And, you know, if it takes you two, three years longer than the next person to qualify in the grand scheme of a 40, 50 year career, I genuinely don't think it matters. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, you know, and yeah, so. I said, excellent. I will drop the links to those in, in the description, whether that's on the podcasting channels or on YouTube. Um, so be sure to check out Ayaz Sayas. Thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure. I mean, the, the hour's flown by. Flown um, by. It's Absolutely. been a while since I've talked about law and the legal industry. So it's been a good, good episode for me. Uh, but thank you for being here and hope you enjoyed it as the guest. Uh, um, and hope you, the audience, enjoyed it as well. And I will see you on the next episode. Take care now. Bye bye. Thanks.